truly a pleasure to be here. Um, like many of you, I am um, first very, very honored uh, to have a chance to spend some time with so many great economists. Most importantly, though, this lecture is quite important to me because I think, like some of you, I think of myself as a perpetual Marty Feldstein student. Um, Marty taught me uh, graduate-level macroeconomics um, in 1978, I believe. Um, full disclosure, I was probably not his best student, but I was certainly one of his most attentive students. Um, and now Marty is teaching me a bit about tax policy because he and I are working together on the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board and Marty is uh, chairing some work there. Um, and so the arc of our relationship uh, goes way back and continues to this day. Um, I also look at his partner, Kate Felstein, whom everyone knows. Uh, I suspect um, Kate has not, I don't think you've co-written uh, anything recently, but when I was an undergraduate, and a graduate student, Marty and Kate, were also famous because they had uh, joint responsibility for writing columns as well. So while this is the Marty Feldstein lecture, I know that my, my spouse would want me to say something uh, honoring the other part <laughs> of the Feldstein household. Um, so let me then turn to the topic that you'd expect me to talk about, one, because it was advertised, but secondly, because of my current role, which is I am, as Jim said, the president and CEO of TI Cref. We have about 3.7 million participants. When I joined the role, because I had spent so many years in academia, I think I knew about 2 million of my participants personally. <laughs> I will now make sure I shake hands with everybody else. And when I meet all of you today, I will get myself to about 3.25 million participants that I know personally. So it's a pleasure to see all of you. Um, I'm going to uh, stand on many of your shoulders here in talking about this important issue of retirement and retirement security for the 21st century. Many of you have done some research on that topic. I will be referring to it, hopefully not mangling uh, your key results. Uh, let me start by the point that I think all of us know, which is that we clearly are at a pivotal moment in terms of our national thinking uh, about retirement and retirement security. Uh, over the past 30 years, the responsibility for funding retirements and the associated risks have been shifted from the employer to individuals. Second challenge that we see, Social Security, one of Marty's topics, provides a retirement income floor for retirees, but as we all know, the system will soon annually pay out more than it collects. And it's unclear when policymakers will develop the appetite uh, for making difficult choices to return the system to a more stable footing. And so this is clearly the intersection of good economic policy, which Marty has taught many of us, uh, and politics, so political economy very much at the fore when it comes to what to do with Social Security and importantly, when to do it. The third big issue is the demographic challenge that we all understand. Uh, the largest generation in American history has begun to retire. 76 million of us baby boomers will eventually at some point start to move from an accumulation phase into a payout phase. Uh, and so that is going to be uh, the third big challenge. And as though all of these things are not complex enough, we are recovering from the deepest recession that we've had in 70 years. Uh, and a recession that has left uh, many, if not most people, less confident about their ability to achieve retirement security. And so against all of those things, I think it's really in time to start to th rethink uh, the retirement system for the 21st century. And so what I'm going to do in my talk first is, again, uh, set the ground, a little more detail I've done uh, already. I'm going to talk about what I think are some of the core features that would be part of a retirement system for the 21st century hopefully avoiding going over the NBR line in terms of making policy recommendations, but since I am um, uh, not an academic economist, you'll forgive me if I move a little bit in that direction. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, ask a number of questions that I think you have been asking uh, and uh, leverage off of some of the work that has been done by many people in this room. And then finally, I'm going to highlight three or four research areas where I think um, all of you in this room who look at aging, demographics, retirement, social security, et cetera, can help those of us in the private sector think through what we think the right answers are. So let me begin with a brief overview of how the contours of the U.S. retirement system have changed over the past few decades, and this is going to, going to be level setting uh, for most of you. The most significant change, obviously, is that defined benefit systems of the previous generation uh, have become increasingly rare. According to the EBRI, the Employee Benefits Research Institute, only 33% of private sector employees have access to a divine benefit plan in 2008. That compares with over 84% 30 years ago, so a dramatic shift in the last generation. 
In the place of these uh, defined benefit plans, we see a patchwork of individual accounts that is clearly put in, putting greater responsibility and greater risk for retirement income on uh, individual workers. Uh, the 401k plans, which as all of you know, or you should know, were originally in, uh, envisioned as a way for Americans to supplement the pensions made available by the employers, have instead become for many workers their primary means of saving for retirement. And in doing so, the talk about retirement savings has moved from how much you'll have at the end, income and retirement, to the other question, which is asset accumulation. And so the entire dialogue around retirement has actually moved away from retirement and much more towards asset accumulation. Many workers, we think, now devote the bulk of their attention to their quarterly account balances with little thought as to how their accumulated savings will translate into a steady stream of income uh, when they retire. Throughout the 80s, the 90s, and much of the past decade, an increasing uh, reliance on market gains to fund retirement incomes was largely unquestioned. But obviously, the collapse of financial markets in 2008 and the ensuing uh, global re recession have caused many Americans, especially those nearing retirement, to question whether they will be financially secure after they stop working. And many are saying, indeed, can they even stop working and enjoy anything approaching the standard of living uh, to which they are accustomed? And to be fair, that's a good question because the evidence uh, is mixed. And for many people, the answer seems to be maybe they will not be able to live in retirement anywhere approximating a degree of comfort that they had while working. Um, uh, Jim introduced the fact that I was a part of McKinsey, so I will now quote some McKinsey research. Last year, McKinsey and Company found that the average American couple will face a savings gap of around $250,000 at the time of retirement, which obviously is a huge amount of money. Importantly, average 401k balances have recovered some of their lost ground in the market recovery um, that occurred last year and into the first part of this year. But by any measure, and many of you have done these measures, most American workers clearly have not saved enough. So the clear question is, why is it that the 401k framework failed to adequately prepare workers for retirement? And I think there are five or six shortcomings that one can highlight around the 401k model. First, clearly a lack of participation among many eligible workers. Secondly, there was insufficient employer and employee contributions. The third failure was the failure or the inability of many participants to implement an appropriate asset allocation strategy. Fourth, the failure to preserve assets for retirement, and then fifth, the lack of annuitization of accumulated assets in retirement to produce a lifelong income stream. These shortcomings were largely the result from decisions made by workers, because fundamentally in the 401k context, retirement risk burdens, as I've said before, fall disproportionately, often entirely upon workers who, as many of you have pointed out, are clearly not capable of dealing with the risks. On the other hand, employers have benefited substantially over the past three decades by jettisoning uh, the defined benefit pensions. And just taking one look at the auto industry tells you, in fact, that's an industry where their ability to reshape both retirement uh, liabilities and health care liabilities for retirees turned out to be critical in allowing the big three auto companies to avoid extinction. A new element that has entered all of this is that across the country, state and municipal entities are struggling with large gaps between their promised retirement benefits and current assets. While only 33% of private sector employees have an exposure to or the ability to get into a defined benefit plan, in the public sector, 79% um, of those employees uh, have a, a defined benefit plan. Again, that's according to the EBRI. A recent S&P report found that the total unfunded public pension liabilities in the U.S. increased to $457 billion in fiscal year 2008 from $368 billion in 2007. So what has the public sector been doing to cope with this yawning deficit? Public employers are incentivizing their new hires to select defined contribution retirement options rather than the traditional DB options. And so while the define, decline of defined benefit uh, pensions and the rise of DC systems has clearly removed an element of security for Americans uh, in the private sector, that is also occurring more and more uh, in the public sector as well. Um, and so what we're finding is there's a misalignment that's starting to emerge. However, there are some ways in which the current model actually does suit the current working uh, approach. 
There are more frequent job changes, including spells of independent work. And for that reason, uh, it makes less sense for Americans to have their retirement savings tied up to a single employer. So clearly, three facts emerge just as level setting. First, defined benefit pensions have proved unworkable uh, for the vast majority of American businesses. And now, the tide appears to be shifting in the public sector as well. Secondly, DC retirement plans define contribution plans, which shift responsibility to the individuals, often offer less security than defined benefit plans, and put too much emphasis on asset accumulation rather than the retirement income planning. But third, Americans' work patterns have shifted so that portability and individual control are attractive features uh, that workers appreciate in the current system. So given that set of background facts, the challenge for policymakers, for companies such as my own, for economists, all of you, for employers, and for individuals, is how to design a retirement system that offers the flexibility and individual choice that seems to be consistent with the way people work these days, but still provides some genuine security for individual savers. So that when market declines do occur, as I think they inevitably will, retirees and near retirees have an income floor to meet their essential expenses. Um, and so I think the goal ultimately is to develop a retirement system that is grounded in the realities uh, and not attempt to turn the clock back to a system that I think will never return. You can imagine then um, that our company, TI Cref, has focused a great deal of attention on determining which factors are most critical to responding to uh, this plethora of challenges that we confront, but the differences in the way people, in the way people work these days. And there are many subsets of individual needs, obviously, but we've identified three core elements that should be featured in the retirement system, providing what we think of as genuine financial security in retirement. And again, here I'm going to uh, leverage much of the work that's been done by some of the people in the room. So the three components of what I've described as a retirement system for the 21st century are first, sufficient funding, which is clearly going to require greater, greater contributions by both participants and sponsors, by both the employers uh, and the employees. Secondly, as part of that, accumulated savings must account for the full spectrum of expenses that accompany retirement, especially health care expenses, which tend to uh, rise with age. The second core element of the retirement system for the 21st century is appropriate diversification and asset allocation which for the average worker, I think, is going to require increased access to financial advice and education, along with something that many of you have been focused in on, an appropriately designed investment menu with a certain element of automatic behavior. Uh, and then the third core element that I'm going to focus on is guaranteed lifetime, lifetime income in the form of a low-cost, relatively transparent annuity. And I emphasize that because um, financial journalists often criticize annuities for a very, very good reason, which is that many of them are not very transparent and many are high cost. But I think we are going to have to have a debate in this country about what a success and successful annuity would look like versus uh, some of the annuities that are currently available on the market. So let me start uh, and delve into each one of those three areas. First, on sufficient funding. Recent research has clearly demonstrated the overriding importance of retirement plan contribution levels relative to other factors including asset allocation, for ensuring an adequate level of retirement income. Workers who want to maintain a standard of living close to what they enjoy at the end of their working years, uh, at least according to our research, should be aiming to replace at least 70 percent, at least 70 percent of their final salary in retirement. And many say it should be closer to 80 percent. This means that individuals should save at least 10 to 15 percent of their gross annual income. That represents both the combined uh, contributions from employers and employees. So you can see the huge gap that we have. Among 401k plans, sponsors' contributions uh, have averaged, as some of you know, around 3% of wages, but are typically in the form of matches that are dependent on the level of worker contributions. Uh, the most common match today is 50 cents per dollar, up to the first 6% of pay. So what we've seen is that among eligible workers who participate, Contributions average less than 6% of pay for non-highly compensated workers and around 7% for highly compensated workers. Adding to the challenge of saving enough is that currently half of American workers do not have access to an employer-sponsored plan. 
and among those who don't have a workplace retirement plan, fewer than 10% have an individual account, such as a traditional or a Roth IRA. And adding to this issue around savings and building up enough uh, for retirement is asset retention. Savings can only grow if they remain in the plan. And 401k plans, which are allowed for loans, for hardship withdrawals, and lump sum distributions and workers' change jobs, are replete with opportunities for savings to leak out and be used for other purposes. One of the major expenses looming for retirement, and something that does require advanced planning and saving, is health care. And again, looking back at the EBRI research, they show that without an employer-sponsored health plan, a couple retiring at age 65 today is projected to need between $200,000 and $800,000 to supplement Medicare and, other, and to cover other out-of-pocket health care expenses during retirement. Now, obviously, the state of health care and health care savings and expenses is likely to change, as many of you know, because some of you worked uh, in that area. So this issue of the, how much is going to be required for, for health care in retirement may evolve over time, but these statistics are where we stand today. And that's clearly a staggering sum for most people. Let me go to the second component of the retirement system for the 21st century, which is appropriate diversification and asset allocation. It turns out from much of the research that you have done and others that 15 to 20 fund options should give savers the ability to diversify their investments appropriately. More choices can be confusing and actually lead people to choose less diversified investments. Workers often lack the knowledge to choose appropriate investments and diversify their savings. Uh, Olivia Mitchell, who was one of my classmates uh, at Harvard, and Stephen Utkus in their book, Pension Design and Structure, New Lessons in Behavioral Finance, write that participants tend to use, quote, a naive heuristic. They avoid extremes, pick the middle option, rather than maintain a consistent set of well-ordered risk preferences to, let, to select from the uh, investments offered. Furthermore, according to uh, Mitchell and Utkus, Many plan participants seem to lack a well-formed investment preference at all. So this confusion about investments, investment preferences, and what to select underscores the need for reliable and independent advice as part of the retirement system for the 21st century. Sadly, plans have avoided providing individual advice. Historically, they've done this because there's been a legislated firewall between plan administration and plan advice. Because of the cost and efficiencies of hiring multiple vendors, one for administration and one for advice, many plan sponsors have historically opted for only administration, i.e. not paying for the advice or making that an option. Plan sponsors have also been reluctant to provide advice because they are reluctant to assume financial resp fiduciary responsibility for the advice that is provided to their employees. So just as the science shows that people are often confronted with too many choices, most plans do not make room for advice. The good news there is that recent legislative and regulatory changes have lowered the firewall between plan administration on the one side and advice on the other. As a result, the defined contribution market has in fact been moving to provide individualized investment advice in recent years. And the percent of 401k plans offering investment advisory services has increased from about 37%, so call it roughly around third, one third in 2005, to around 50% uh, last year. Investment and financial education can have a positive impact on participant investment decisions. Nonetheless, nonetheless, an individual cannot be made to learn. And as much research has shown, the reality is that many workers do not have the time or the interest to develop adequate financial literacy as it relates to retirement planning and savings. The third core element of a plan for the 21st century that would increase the likelihood of achieving retirement security is to make guaranteed income uh, for life and make those options more broadly available. Guaranteed income in the form of annuities, whose guarantee obviously is subject to the claims paying ability of the insurance company writing the contract, can make it possible to reintroduce an element of security that has been missing from most private sector 401k plans for the past three decades. Annuities can be made available within a plan as an accumulation vehicle and as a distribution option upon retirement or through both accumulation and the distribution phases. 
uh, at my company, TIA Crafts, we encourage people to annuitize at least enough of their savings so that combined with Social Security, they have an income stream to meet their basic expenses in retirement, housing, utilities, taxes, food, etc. And in addition, we also encourage them to recognize that the value of these annuitized payments should ideally be protected, at least partially, against erosion by inflation, which means an annuity language having both a fixed annuity and also having a variable annuity. So these three core elements, sufficient funding, appropriate asset allocation, and guaranteed income, should be, I believe, at the root of all of our efforts to help Americans save for a secure retirement. And we've seen some anecdotal evidence that when one offers this approach, um, that has some beneficial effects for both plan sponsors and plan participants. I'm going to cite one example, obviously, again, from TI Cref, um, because I think we're the ones that are most associated with your market, the higher education retirement market is the one that we understand the best. So what we've seen in our recent research from our institute is that 80% of higher education employees, that's 80%, and I should note that this includes employees across higher education, not just our participants. So 80% describe themselves as being somewhat confident or very confident that they will have enough money to live comfortably in retirement for those who have this kind of model. Among all U.S. workers, just about 50% report such confidence. And so clearly developing this kind of model seems to have the desired impact in creating a sense of retirement security for those who have that as an option. This now leads me to my third element that I want to talk about, which is the behavioral aspects of the retirement challenge. So the question is, if we, re if we do design retirement plans or a comprehensive retirement system, that provides more options for people to save appropriately and turn those savings into a steady stream of guaranteed income, are individuals likely to take advantage of those options? Behavioral economists, including some in the room, are clearly doing extensive research to determine how system design can influence participant behavior. Much of the literature that you've been writing focuses on overcoming or leveraging apparently negative tendencies such as inertia and risk aversion with new plan features and approaches, including auto-enrollment of workers and plans and framing choices in a way that motivates optimal decision making. With 401k plans, participants have historically been voluntary, I'm sorry, participation has historically been voluntary on the part of eligible workers. And therefore, one quarter of those eligible workers choose not to participate in a plan. Some choose not to participate for financial reasons, other for behavioral reasons, such as simple inertia, which seems to be a powerful influencer in retirement planning. Uh, in his book, Aging Gracefully, Ideas to Improve Retirement Security, Peter Orzak states, quote, we should recognize the power of inertia in human behavior and use it to promote rather than to hinder savings. Economists, plan designers, and policymakers have looked for ways to use inertia to keep people on the right track, anticipating that they will not muster the motivation uh, to deviate from it. So one idea that is being applied very broadly is to make the process of savings as automatic as possible. And the good news is that plan sponsors have begun automatically enrolling eligible workers in their 401k plans. And obviously, if they do not wish to participate, they can proactively uh, opt out. According to a recent study by the GAO, auto-enrollment can increase participation in employer-sponsored plans to as high as 95%. But sadly, at this stage, only 16% of employer-sponsored plans feature auto-enrollment, with higher rates among larger plan sponsors. The EBRI reports that auto-enrollment has increased the number of near retirees who are on track to have enough money to pay for basic expenses and health care costs from about 41% in 2003 to a little over half today. But auto-enrollment uh, for individuals clearly is not a panacea. Uh, and the work of uh, Choi, Leibson, and others, uh, this was, I think, work back in 2001, 2002, identified that while participation rates increase when employers auto-enroll employees, the overall level of savings may not increase because default contribution levels tend to be fairly low, and employees remain, quote, anchored at those low contribution levels and in overly conservative funds. Now, more recent work by the same group, um, uh, Troy Lapes, and I think Bridget Majorin has been involved in this as well, has shown in many, many ways that how you structure the default uh, does matter. 
So clearly, uh, behavioral economists are giving us a good hint on which directions we should go uh, in structuring the plans that we put together. The other trend that we've seen in an attempt to improve asset allocation is that plan providers and sponsors have made available life cycle or target date funds, which as you know is an investment vehicle that changes asset allocations automatically over time based on target retirement years without the saver ever having to make another decision. In the wake of the financial crisis, however, questions have emerged about the design of life cycle funds as some funds may have been too aggressive or perceived to have been too aggressive for workers near retirement. Another idea that's emerged obviously is auto escalation, automatically increasing an individual's contribution rate over time. And that's also gained broader appeal. And some work by Richard Thaler and Shlomo Benartzi of UCLA has developed um, what's called the Saving More Tomorrow programs, which allows workers to schedule automatic increases in their savings rates. And according to their first case study, participants increased their set-aside rate from 3.5% to more than 13%. Um, and so I think this is, may also be another lesson that those of us in the private sector can learn uh, from what uh, you are teaching us in, in, um, uh, in the academic literature. So that's one of the lessons that we've learned. Now, the other issue, obviously, is the so-called annuity puzzle. Uh, and the question is, why is it that so few uh, households and individuals uh, annuitize when we think that's probably for many the right things to do. First answer is that employers have been reluctant to include annuities as a distribution option. All 401k plans offer a lump sum uh, distribution option, but only about 14% offer the ability to annuitize assets. A commonly cited reason for the plan sponsor's reluctance to offer annuities is fiduciary un uncertainty. And I think their regulatory clarity could go a long way. The other challenge, obviously, is why don't employees purchase them? And research by Gail and John of Retirement Security Project note that private annuities account for just 2%, only 2% of retirees' household incomes. And so the question is, what is driving this annuity puzzle? We've seen two things. One is uh, work by one of our economists at TIA Cref has indicated that if one has access to an annuity option during the accumulation phase, you're much more likely to take annuitization as a payout option. And so that's very, very good. The other thing I think that people worry about is, well, will there be buyer's remorse if I annuitize? And there's good news there, which is that there seems to be no evidence of buyer's remorse in regard to payout annuities. Based on some research, as much as 89% of annuitants report being somewhat or very satisfied uh, with the decision to purchase the payout annuity. And then the final breakthrough on the annuity option, it comes from Jeff Brown, who I know is here in the audience and in full disclosure is a TIA trustee. And Jeff has been teaching us very much the question about how to think about framing uh, on that. And as Jeff says, and I quote, when consumers think in terms of consumption, they perceive the life annuity as offering valuable insurance against the risk of outliving one's retirement source, resources. However, when they think in terms of investment terms, they view life annuities as increasing risk without increasing return uh, because of the potential for variation in the total value of payments based on how long they live. And so clearly from Jeff's work, we've got to understand how better to frame the annuity option. Recently, though, there's also been another discussion around the annuity option, and this comes from Eric Johnson's work, and Eric is at Columbia, and he expanded on the uh, Kahneman and the Tversky research by focus specific, focusing specifically on retirees. And what he uncovered is what he calls hyper-loss aversion among retirees, who are up to, quote, five times more loss averse than the average person. So we have a real challenge when it comes to retirees. Interestingly, however, this hypersensitivity to loss does not translate into a desire to purchase guaranteed income. Instead, what Johnson has found is that retirees who exhibit hyper-loss aversions are sadly less likely to annuitize because they see giving up immediate control of their savings as another type of loss. So clearly, in spite of great research that's been done in plan structuring and by behavioral economists, there are a number of topics and issues that are open for, for study. And so I'd like to now turn to my last topic and then open up for questions and answers. Um, but here are four, three or four research topics that I, as a practitioner in this area, would like to turn to you as researchers to help us figure out what we should do next. 
The first is how to deal with the entire challenge of the fact of financial literacy or the low level of financial literacy in our country. And the challenge is clearly we've learned a great deal from behavioral economists about automatic approaches, automatic savings, automatic enrollment, automatic escalation. The research has shown that there's some potential upsides but maybe some downsides about too much automaticity. So the first question um, that I worry about is what is the right mix of automatic plan features with advice and education? Uh, since we clearly know that automatic behaviors are probably right on average, but are probably wrong for many, many participants. So you can help us think about that balance between automatic behaviors uh, and education. The second question ties into uh, the age, obviously, the participant. So the second question I have is, at what point in his career is it advisable for a participant to stop being an Autobot, if you will, and become a planner? who saves and invests according to his or her own plan. And we know that there's generally an aversion to planning among all of us, but at what point should we really be pushing individuals to move out of the automatic enrollment, automatic uh, escalation, and really start to think and plan for themselves? And then the third issue is how much income should people save? I've thrown out a number of 10 to 15 percent. Uh, I found, as I've done the research for this and others have supported me on it, that there's really no consensus around that question. And I think if we can clarify that goal, we'll help individuals to fully understand what it is that they need to save. Um, and finally, and I think most importantly, we also have to recognize something that people do not fully understand, which is they will often be living in some form of retirement for 20 to 30 years. So how do we educate individuals about the longevity risk that they confront? Because I think it's much easier for them to understand the risk of loss as opposed to the risk of outliving uh, one's resources. And so let me stop by saying just a number of things. First, uh, we clearly are confronting a retirement crisis in America. It's been made much worse by the economic crisis, but weaknesses in Social Security that Marty has been teaching us about for many, many years and the aging population have conspired to bring uh, the current risks in the system uh, much more uh, to everyone's attention. The second point I've made is that I think, at least, it's going to be very difficult to go back to the system that we had in the 40s, 50s, and even the 60s of defined benefit plans for everyone. And so we do need a retirement system for the 21st century, as I describe it. That would have uh, three major components. First is getting people to save enough through a combination of automatic enrollment, automatic escalation, and education. Secondly, helping them understand the importance of an appropriate asset allocation, which could either be automatic through life cycle funds or through a combination of life cycle funds and education. And the third point I made was really we have to focus in on the annuity option, which is one that is simply underutilized um, by all Americans for a variety of reasons, having in many cases to do with the complexity of annuities, but that should not stand in the way of fixing the problem. Uh, and then the, third, the fourth point I've made is that behavioral economists have helped us a great deal, particularly in doing some research around the automatic state of things. But finally, I've thrown out a challenge of my four research questions at the very end. And so with that, uh, we agree that I'd stop around 5.15. I will bring this to a close. Thank you very, very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much.